This video is brought to you by Card Kingdom. Head on over to cardkingdom.com to pre-order your Time Spiral Remastered cards today. Hey everyone, and welcome to the very first Commander Clash podcast. That's right, we're doing a podcast now. So instead of us sitting down and playing a game of EDH or Commander, we're gonna be talking about Commander and just broad topics. So uh, after this first episode, we're actually going to be taking a uh, fish mail. So if you want to have any questions for the future or maybe topics that you want discussed, uh, let us know by using the hashtag Clash Mail and it's gonna be popping up on the screen right now. Good job, editor, AKA me this time. Um, so for our inaugural, Episode one, we're going to be talking about a controversial topic. Ooh, not in the way of like, ooh, is white bad or good, but we're going to be talking about the role of arch enemy in Commander. So first, just a groundwork on what arch enemy is. Basically, in a four player Commander game, it's usually a free for all and you're usually on the fly deciding who's the greatest threat and trying to jostle your way into a position where you can win the game. Sometimes though, and by sometimes I mean very often, there's going to be a person at the table who, for whatever reason, is just unanimously decided upon. The other three people have decided that that person is the greatest threat and they need to be removed from the game or their problematic cards need to be neutralized before you know you can start focusing on other threats at the table, other people at the table. And that is the arch enemy role. That is the person who has unified the rest of the table against them. And we're gonna discuss uh, first off like what makes people arch enemy? Is there like a common thread or anything like that? And, and how to deal with that situation once that happens. So first, I want to just go around the table and ask, what is a card that will make you immediately say, oh, that person right there, that's the arch enemy at the table. We got to take that person down. So I'm going to start off with Richard. Is there any card in particular that you think of when, when you're like, oh my goodness, that card is immediately arch enemy status or that commander is arch enemy status. Like, I don't know, half the cards in commander. <laughs> like, I, I don't, if you just go down a tier list of commander, usually for me, it's something that can win the game and I choose Golos. Uh, so if you have Golos in your command zone and you are approaching six mana, seven mana, you need to go. Like, no matter how bad your deck is, right? If you just Golos <laughs> and start spinning Golos, you will win, right? It doesn't matter if you're doing a fair deck or anything, right? If your deck has any kind of semblance of synergy or power, like, you'll win on the spot. So, Golos, uh, you have a couple free turns to, to do something, but then... My targets are on Golos. I, I I don't like Golos the card. It gets Field of Dead on top of whatever it's doing, right? You get the Field of Dead, you get the Spinny Spinny, and it's <laughs> it's a bad time. It's a bad time. But what about what about if I'm doing uh you know uh Trilobite Tribal, Richard? What if I'm Look, doing Look, if, if I tribal? were able to get Field of Dead and three skeletons every turn on Golos, you would also be snap killing Golos. <laughs> It doesn't matter how bad your cards are when they cost you zero mana and like zero cards from hand, right? It's also, yeah. like Golos pays for like pretty much half of his own tax, right? Yes. So, so yeah, you, inherently resilient. Do you think that Golos fits into like a bigger archetype of arch enemy cards? Like, I kind of think of it as it, it's something that lets you play big things without a lot of mana. So would you consider like Kinnon or maybe like Joyra? Like, would you consider those? similar in any way like are those also arch enemy cards and Golos is just the worst of them or i i would say they're all like in the same tier of arch enemy they're different types of like arch enemy because you know some will just combo off instantly whereas of like i don't know it's hard to just go over a Golos deck you'll never go bigger than a Golos deck yeah it's true and the fact like it goes big and it's resilience for removal. And it's, it's kind of interesting because um, I used to be really high on a card, uh, Joda Archmage Eternal, which functions very similarly to Golos. The entire 
aspect of the deck. It's a five color commander, and you can pay Wooburg instead of the mana cost of, of spells to cast them. So the idea is to just like jam a bunch of super expensive spells and then Jode is being able to cast them uh, for just five mana each time or for free if you have Fist of the Suns out. Um, but the problem with Joda and the thing that keeps it in check is that if you kill Joda a lot, then you're stuck having to hard cast all your big spells, right? So, like, I think one or two years after Jota was released, we got Golos. And Golos does the exact same thing, where you're cheating out giant spells off the top of your library this time instead of your hand, which is arguably even better. But, like, you kill Golos, and then it's, okay, well, Golos entered the battlefield and brought ramped out a land, so it already paid for half of its commander attacks. You're almost doing it a favor by letting it die and be recast so you can get another powerful land card. So it's just kind of funny, like... I never assumed Joda is an arch enemy, and, and yet it does the exact same thing. But Golos, because of like that insane resiliency to removal, just puts it over the top. And then what, it's like, yeah, I have to you, kill it. Every you Golos time. and you feel the dead, right? <laughs> you Golos and you can either pay for your commander tax entirely, you get like a Temple of the False God, or you know half of your commander tax. You Golos and you Maze of it, right? Like you, there's all kinds of like stupid cards you can just get up just casting the Golos, like Golos Mystic Sanctuary. Fine, right? But <laughs> you haven't even activated it yet. You haven't even done it. You just literally cast it, right? And it's very yeah. hard to remove, right? So I think it's actually a step above the other ones because the other ones just don't come back forever, right? And every yeah. time they come back, they gain value, even if you kill it on the, on the spot, right? Golos does. So yeah, I, I, I don't like Golos. And I think Seth has tried to play fair Golos. Still not very fair, right? Yeah. Like, it, like, it just <laughs> doesn't work, right? Thank you, right? You were like, I'm doing a fair Golos, and I don't even... What is it, like ultimatums or something? I think it was all the ultimatums, yeah. Oh, and uh, it, w it was still really good. Like, casting stuff for free is really powerful, and ramping all the time is really powerful, so... Mm. And that's the problem, because eventually... you'll it, Like, as they, if they don't kill it, right? Because eventually your table does run out of ways to interact with Golos, right? And, and let's say that even if they don't, you'll get to a point where you'll have so much mana where you can instantly to just respond by activating mm -hmm. right and then it's like all right well cool i lost my golos but check this out i got three ultimatums <laughs> or something like that i guess yes. i'm okay with this trade <laughs> high value very resilient to removal and the combination of both makes it very tricky uh but what else would you say is an arch enemy status card that you have to deal with immediately something perhaps a little bit different than golos <laughs> Well, okay, if you're asking me, there's two things that I'll kill instantly. A mono green commander, and then also, it, like, it doesn't matter which green commander. Any if, it's, if it's mono green, green I'll kill it. Well, <laughs> like, that is quite the umbrella there. <laughs> like, like, it's like, oh, I'm sorry, are you mono green? You gotta go. Like, because like, I know everything that green does, and it's all redundant, it's all the same. But, uh, it's another one is actually a mono, mono blue commander, and it's Urza. If I see Urza... Mm. I don't know, like, I think I saw you tweet about this, Tomer, and it's about artifacts. You don't even have, like, you can try to build an artifact deck where it's not broken, but somehow something is still broken. Yeah, so, so that tweet was, I was trying to build a Grixis artifact deck, and my goal, my established goal for the stream was to not have a combo in it. And then sure enough, somebody pointed out that I had a combo in it. Yeah. Because every uh, artifact was, just yeah. eventually kind of combos off. Urza does, specifically... does it count as a combo if you don't understand or play your combo? <laughs> I feel like I would have accidentally fallen into it because it was time sieves, time sieve. I don't know how to say that word. Yeah, okay. And Thopter Assembly. Both cards, just <laughs> I put them in for value. <laughs> Isn't that like the go-to combo for quite a while? I didn't really, I didn't know. I've never played it before. <laughs> I played I, it and I took it out of my deck. <laughs> I just wanted to take some extra turns. I thought, Oof, this is good value. You know, I have a bunch of token makers of like Sahili and stuff. And I thought, oh, this seems innocuous enough. I had no, none of like the Ashnod's altars, none of the Phyrexian altars, none of the grinding stations. All of them were just removed. And I was like, this, this feels nice and non-infinite. There's no way to make infinite mana. I'm good. <laughs> and then boom, I, it's like, oh, by the way. I feel like Urza actually is sort of like a double whammy arch enemy commander because not only do you have all the combos 
but it's also like a stacks commander. So not only are you thinking like, because I think good comes from that's Earth. like, <laughs> I think that's another archetype of Arch Enemy is when people play commander, they like to actually like play their stuff. So if you're the person who's like, hey, stasis lock, you didn't win or but it doesn't affect me. Like yeah, people are going to try to kill you. So not only do you have like the combo, like, oops, I didn't even know I had a combo, but I'm comboing off like Tomer. But then you could also just get like randomly locked out of the game by winter orb so <laughs> yeah yeah and like and the like you know on top of that like urza like just spins something off the top of their deck for however much they want or like and it's very easy to untap an urza or because like if you're playing a bunch of artifacts once again just something will break and it's funny watching an artifact player play through their deck just like tomer did and realize oh that is a combo. Wait, there's another combo? Oh, whoops. Like, so, <laughs> whoops, and, and, he, it is. and when I say Urza, I also, that kind of just applies to any artifact commander. Brea, wait, no, not Brea. That's an angel. Right, no. No, no, Brea's, no Brea's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. No, I'm thinking of Bruna. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Brea is it like an artifact deck, and like there's 19,000 different ways to like, like combo off with that, and really any artifact commander, and this falls under Joyra too, so. So we got res like super resilient value engines like Golos. We got like oops all combo decks that even when built fairly, uh, like Urza. And like like Seth, you also mentioned uh, like stacks related stuff. Yeah. So so I would I would say, I mean I think you're right. Like I'm scared of combo commanders. I'm scared of Golos. But I think another archetype is like commanders that you know are built to not let you play magic so uh grand arbiter would be one of them i think would be on the list like that's i guess it's not the worst of the bunch vorinclex original vorinclex is like mm -hmm. oh you don't get to use your lands and then i think like related to that i would kind of throw in like discard commanders a little bit uh, even though it's a different sort of stacks but like turgrid wrathing your hands so you can't cast anything <laughs> is kind of the same as like getting all your cool. lands blowed up or getting stasis locked or whatever so uh, i think the stacks commanders are one that i target even if i don't think that they're that good just because mm -hmm. i know the game for me is going to become less fun once they start doing their thing so so i tend yeah. to try to take that player out for fun reasons more so than power level sometimes yeah, I had a I had a friend who um when when I started playing Commander, he just loved Grand Arbiter. <laughs> and he was like, "Wow, this is ramp for me in Azorius <laughs> colors as Commander. That's so cool. Like it's just a good value engine." <laughs> um he was hated out every single time we played the game, and it wasn't because he was a stacks deck per se, it's just that his Commander was the only thing that was stacks related. And he was running it because he liked the, the ramp aspect and it slowed down the opponents a little bit. But he had no, like, winter orbs or any any of that sort of stuff in the deck. Um, but, yeah, just he was always hated out because it's like, just that, that extra mana you have to spend to always cast your spells just feels bad. And it's like, I want, to, I want my deck to do things and uh, you're not letting me do the things. I, therefore, must eliminate you like, so i could do my things more um i guess also on the personal for me there was one card very very much like stacks but in a different sort of way uh one of the first decks that i ever built when i like a custom deck that i ever built was like a lands tribal deck under child of alara and uh the idea of the deck was just to you know ramp out a bunch of utility lands and stuff and eventually win with like mazes end and 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 jank like that and Child of Alara was there uh, to establish a, a soft lock on the table where I would have a sack outlet like Phyrexian Altar, for example, or sorry, Phyrexian Tower. And then I would have a way to immediately recur every single turn, like a Mary of the Sky Ruin. And I would just, you know, every single turn, I would just on demand wipe the board of all things so nobody could bother with my lands and then win with lands. I took that deck apart after playing it three times. <laughs> Three times. <laughs> what, I, I, that was what, me and, like, Eureka. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I love ninjutsu, but, like, it, it's... The, the, I guess, like, that one is not most so, so much a power level thing. I mean, I, you could say Eureka is, like, pretty powerful, but, like, I think it's because it, it will always do the same thing. Yeah. It'll and it's so hard to stop, same. right? Like, you yeah. kill Eureka, and it's like, okay, whatever. Ninjutsu yeah. is still two mana, always. Yeah. It doesn't matter. It's kind of like, it's kind of like Golos in that way, where it's just right. too hard to shut down. And it's too good at what it does, right? 
Yeah, definitely. It's too disgusting. Mm -hmm. And then the patterns of play are kind of boring. So, like, you'll see that a lot of the decks that I like playing will be, like, things that have a lot of random stuff in there or a lot of stealing, cha like, you know, swapping of, like, permanents. Just because it all, uh, the, most games won't play the same. Mm -hmm. Krim, like, sits down to randomly build decks and somehow his Scryfall random is counterbalance every time. <laughs> <laughs> random. It, it turns out it's a I bug. Am, it was in the random command. <laughs> and I got Lazav, and I'm like, oh, they're not going to believe me. <laughs> it's too well, perfect. <laughs> so, so one category we haven't talked about is, like, combo commanders sitting in your command zone. And so there, there are, like, obvious ones, like, you know, they go infinite. But even things like an overrun commander, uh, I played birds. Like yes, Missouri? birds will be out, uh, and and I consciously chose not to put a good commander in the command zone because they would get me killed. Like the right? there, there, there are birds that overrun when they attack or come enter the battlefield. What, which means the minute you have like three or four birds, everyone will kill you, right? Because they see the overrun sitting there, right? So you, yeah. you definitely don't want that kind of stuff sitting in your command zone unless you're prepared to deal with it right like if you are a fast combo deck and you're trying to go off on turn two or three before anyone can can touch you then okay that's fine but you can't sit there with like an overrun or like an infect kill or i mean it's kind of like the same as doing like turn one beastmaster ascension like you don't do that right yeah. because everyone will kill you as soon as you have a couple creatures on board unless so, you like everything on like super hard mode like you're playing like dark souls or something oh, like that. dark souls <laughs> commander <Because, edition. laughs> yeah <laughs> Because, because like that, I, I, I it, you're, you're, you're stacking the, the table against you, yeah. and your commander, like even if like you're doing yourself like a, a not really any favors by playing. Let's just say like when I played Anala, but I made it was a really really bad Anala, and but it didn't matter because it was Anala. So the table was going against me, and on top of that, you know, I I kind of like hurt myself by building a bad version of Anala. So. <laughs> There's not like I there's not a way where I can insta kill the whole table for like going after me. So yeah. I think I think it's commanders that can win the game the turn they come into play. Like I think that hits on like the overrun thing, but also like Kinnan or Zerda are commanders that I'm really afraid of because you know it's just like, oh, there's one card infinite mana combos, and one of the pieces are in the command zone, so they already have half of their combo. And you know that if you don't have the interaction at instant speed at the right time, or if they have a silence or they have a counter spell or something, like they're just gonna get you. There's not anything you can do about it. So a lot of times you just got to try to take the player out before they draw their combo pieces, like the player removal thing. So, yeah, because even if you kill that commander once, like what's going to happen the next time they recast their commander. And if like they're in blue, for example, they have like counter magic backup or something like that. Like, yeah, you can't just let, you can't just kill the commander and be like, all right, uh, we have solved the issue. We can progress. It's more like we've killed the commander and now, like, this buys us a couple turns maximum before we might just lose the game. So we have to, like, deal with that at all times. Another really good one is Narset. Because Narset, mm -hmm. like, it's so hard to deal with, and it always does the same thing, and you know it's going to come down with haste and, like, try to win the game the turn it comes down. So what do you do against Narset other than try to kill the Narset player before they can resolve Narset? And I don't know, you're not being mean, but, like, what else can you do from the other side of the table? That was another deck that I owned that I properly <laughs> removed. So what if so you, you play like these commanders? And okay. How do you how do you play these commanders if you actually like them? I, I think we've established that playing fair versions of these decks don't work. People will kill you yeah. anyway. Uh, either they'll kill you anyway, or your deck is not actually fair. It's actually just Golos. Uh, so <laughs> what do you do if, if like that's your favorite commander? You're like, yeah, this is like why I started EDH, and I really like this card, and I really vibe with the character. Like, how do you what do you do with these? I well, I think decks? this is a great this is a great question for uh, Krim to take on because Krim is a what? Red resident uh, arch enemy villain at the table quite often, <laughs> or historically speaking, for our play group. Uh, but you seem to actually embrace that role. It doesn't seem like something that you're just so happen to fall into. It's something that you usually seek out, but it actually works really well in our play group. So how do you actually go about doing that, Krim? And why? Why, Krim? Why? <laughs> I, so when I go go into this, I, I actually, a little bit like how we had mentioned earlier, you I build my decks, like, and I build it to where... I know everybody's going after me. So I, I eventually I essentially do not play a ton of one for ones. You'll often see in my decks where it's like, oh well, 
Surely somebody has spot removal. No, I only have things that blow up everything. <laughs> like, <laughs> because I just always play as if I'm arch enemy. So it's like, eh, I try to like have some spot removal, but usually it's just everything has, has to go. Fire sale all the time. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so I, I have a little sub theme and, and I, I, I would honestly say that I would incorporate this into your deck building, which is that it's almost like a little bit of board wipe tribal <laughs> like in every deck I have. And I also, why I seek it out is because it's fun. You can to lean into it, right? You can actually then, because you're, you're already assumed to have all these broken things in there, right? Mm -hmm. So I kind of lean into it a little bit. Obviously, I don't go as like, you know, full on like ridiculous spell slinger or something like that. But I do lean in and it's just fun. It's, it's, it's fun to, because you, there's a feeling you get when there's, you have like six cards in hand and five of them are lands. And the whole table is worried about it. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> what is that? Uh, he has the worst thing possible. Yeah. It's a hull breacher. It's yeah. a hull breacher us. As long as you have blue mana open, like, you just pass. It's just humorous because, like, I don't, like, Richard, I think, experienced this when I think he played Kai Kar or something like that. And he's like, I, I have a bunch of cards in hand and I pass with blue mana and everybody keeps hitting me and I have nothing. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> Kaikar is definitely another arch enemy too. It's like yeah. you let Kaikar, Kaikar go on the battlefield; he's gonna combo off. But it's, I think, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was gonna say it's just like the like the role of arch enemy is it. Someone's going to become it anyway, so I just take the role like willingly. I'm like, you know what? Let's <laughs> lean into it. <laughs> I think I also appreciate that because I, I find like arch enemy is totally fine at a table but it's really how you approach that and your mentality for it and for you crim like you actually like embrace it and you enjoy the role of arch enemy which actually makes it a fun like it makes it part of the dynamic at the table but what i, I have noticed is for people who aren't looking to be the arch enemy they they just like find an arch enemy commander that they really like and they don't like being targeted right like they they're like i'm playing a brea deck and sure it's really powerful but like Right now, I'm on the board state. My board state's not that scary, you know. The, and why are people targeting me? And, <clears> and they get that, salty about, it. like, they get upset about that. And that kind of like ruins the dynamic of the table because people are like, "Well, you have Brea, you can just randomly combo off and win. We have to kill you." And the yeah. person who's like, "Well, I don't, I can't combo right now," and somebody else like Jimmy over there is is the main threat. Why aren't you? Why aren't we focusing on Jimmy? You're just focusing on me, and this sucks. It's I suck, and because that person's sad. Then everybody's like just not having a good time. Uh, yeah, but yeah, it seems like it seems like when you play when you play the commander, it's like the arch enemy status. Like you're not actually salty about it. You're like, come at me, bro. You know, like. <laughs> <laughs> well, every every anime has a great villain, and you need one of those. So, like, yeah. <laughs> I, I I think the thing is that that's exactly the mindset you don't want to be in, right? You don't want to be like, oh, well, I can't kill you. Like that argument never works if I have a Brea. I can't kill you right now. Look at my board. That never works because you know in the history of Brea decks, it's not like, oh, okay, I don't just draw one card and you lose the game. Yeah. So, so your whole deck is a one-card combo. So the, I think the biggest thing is when you play these decks, you do have to tell yourself, like, you, you have to understand that you will be targeted. So that mm -hmm. should uh, factor into your deck building and your mentality while you're playing. So, And if, example, like one of my favorites is Nekusar. And, and I, I love Negusar because I love drawing cards. And I think it's funny because everybody loves drawing cards too. So wh why, why is everybody mad at me now? You know what I mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> But keep in mind, that was when Commander just started, okay? I got yeah. the pre-con. So, like, I, you know, that was, like, the pillar of EDH eventually. But <laughs> that as a Commander is one of my favorites. And it's hilarious to play. But, and and I, I do not expect to ever live past turn four. <laughs> My Mogus deck, is per, its sole intent is to annoy the table with like Ankh of Mishra and just a bunch of things like that, and I know I'll never live. I'll never Crim live to turn with like six. Krim so, annoying the table. Who, yeah. who would have Who would have thought? <laughs> but yeah. I, I build decks that don't actually plan to win or live past like eight mana, so I like I, all I do is just, the goal is to make everybody's day a little more annoying, and that's it. Uh, at the same time, eight mana for you, Krim, is like 40 turns. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've won. We got, we got some time. We got some time. I don't know. I've won? I've gotten to turn 80. So, like, yeah, like that. that is, I would say, the main thing going into this. Just 
understand that when you're playing a commander uh, at, at that power level, you will be targeted. So do and mm-hmm. and the, and that the argument is just it's invalid. It's like oh, I can't kill you right now. Yeah, well, you know, come on. <laughs> yeah. I, I think if you look at it from the other side of being the person that wants to avoid that, I think you just got to change your commander. Like, I have definitely tried the, like, oh, don't worry, it's the fair version of insert broken commander here, and it never works. Like, that that argument (laughs) has never worked a single time. Uh, So I think you actually, like, even if you really love Bray or Golos or something, you might have more fun playing the exact same 99 and turning your Golos into whatever, Jota, or oh, yeah. into a Tagatog, or like something that isn't as threatening. Because then you're going to. That's good. No not, one touch. <laughs> yeah, oh, yeah. That, that's one of my go tos. Like, <laughs> no one no one ever targets a Tagatog player. So, but I think that that. Why like, I don't think there's any other option. Like, is there any other way to not be the arch enemy and still play like the busted arch enemy commanders you play with other busted decks so uh, yeah. you sit down versus an urza and a golos <laughs> and uh, edgar markov and like who you kill who knows yeah, right? yeah. it's a normal then it's game actually, of magic it's actually it balanced because everybody just yeah. kind of goes off and that's like where you start reaching like cadh like this is like the first step towards cdh i would say is where everybody's running busted commanders everybody could win at any given time and then that arch enemy status is no longer no longer like a pre- uh, like a guaranteed for any specific player. It's more based on what people's board states are at any given time. And yeah. I think like once you start high, like once you get the high optimized versions of those decks, then you're in CDH territory, right? Uh, it's just like that. It's like that weird transition spot where you're not playing at that level, and one person is, and then and then it's like, yeah, well, I'm running a CDH worthy you know, commander or a commander that's so much higher than everybody else is, you got to focus on that person first. Uh, but it was kind of interesting how you were saying, like, uh, how do you how do you avoid it if you're like if you're playing an arch enemy commander? And I feel like the only person who's gotten away with it a couple times in their play group, not always, but sometimes Richard has sometimes pulled off, I think, some situations where he's playing a scary commander and yet and yet. He doesn't get murdered immediately. Richard, what what are some tips? You know, like you're playing <laughs> You're playing a commander uh, that might be scary. How do you how do you how do you make sure that you're just not eliminated immediately? So so Krim, you live in California. Yeah. What, what what happens when you get attacked by a grizzly bear? What do you do? You play dead. You play dead. <laughs> If it's a black bear, you fight back, by the way. But if it's a grizzly bear, you have no chance you play dead. So if you are playing an insanely powerful commander, you need to show everyone you're dead. And you may do this by playing birds, like two mana one ones, skeletons. You know, you, you, like, look, I accidentally chose a scary commander and I didn't know it was scary. But look at my deck. It's all birds. <laughs> right? So, I don't know. You just need to be, like, not threatening uh yeah. like when, when people think like the whole point of arch enemy is to neutralize the greatest threat right and when that person is done you move on to the second person right so what you what you don't want to do is like ramp out ahead of everyone have like 20 mana have a scary commander like you're, you're guaranteed to be targeted right nobody yeah. would do that at that play group <laughs> yeah does yeah that you, you can't like ramp out and then wheel for a <laughs> new hand and then be like oh why is everyone <laughs> afraid of me right <laughs> Sorry, just again clearing my throat. <laughs> so, so yeah, you you just gotta play slow. You gotta have the reputation of playing fair. Like I think in a vacuum in our play group, Tomer always dies first, right? Because you it's know, like Seth will like spend eight turns drawing cards and then end up with like some horrendous combo that probably might not work, right? Krim will counter a bunch of stuff, but then like that's all he'll do, <laughs> right? Hey. Like that'll be it. <laughs> But Tomer will like come in with like the two card combo on turn eight and be like, "Hey guys, I'm, this is my paper deck. It's budget, right?" It's budget. So, and then I'll play a bunch of like dirty birds or something, but I'm like one wrath away from it all falling apart, right? You see it coming, so it's like nice and slow, and there's like no surprise factor there. So, I, I think that reputation also affects it. Like if Tomer mm. plays something that looks comboish. Like plus his personality, plus we know it's his paper deck. Like he's dying first, right? Like, well, and, well yeah. Tomer, Tomer definitely like half sh- like flexes the combo. <laughs> Usually, like it, it's it's like 
What was yeah? Just recently we had Budget Week and Tomer had Orvar or whatever, and half like kind of like looks threatening because I'm gonna bounce and play Mystic Sanctuary a hundred times and see what happens. Yeah, he, well, did, he, usually, he didn't finish the combo. Usually when you flex that part, you're either a going to win, which Tomer did not do, or you know which did happen, you die <laughs> because now you're a threat because you revealed part of your hand. It doesn't matter if if mm. the table knows what you're up to. Like, ah, I know exactly what card you're going to win with. It's that you can do that, and that's never a fair thing. On top of that, Richard is the kind of, like, like villain where he's quiet. He's the one that's surprised. Mm. What an anime twist. <laughs> I, I And I think, like, it's great that we have that villain, and then we also have, like, I, I play the villain that's more of, like, announces their game plan while they're, like, you know, like, putting you on the train tracks and giving the heroes the time to monologue. respond. It's like, yeah, let you me tell you my plan, so you can my be life like, story. Heroes, yeah. heroes, have time to, you know, escape it or yeah. anything while I monologue for you. Yeah. I, I, think, I think Richard does a really good job of showing you his bad cards to make his mm. deck look horrible and, like, playing that up, but then not ever showing you the good cards until the turn that he's going to, like, do his thing. Like, I, I feel like yeah. that's how Richard mm -hmm. wins most of the games, and I think you got to have, like, both parts, because if Richard didn't play the horrible birds, you're going to be thinking, oh my goodness, he's setting up for, like, this win con, but because he plays these creatures that look so horrible, and you're just kind of, like, laughing at the skeletons, you're not thinking, like, oh, he's setting yeah. up this turn where he's just going to, like, kill us all and win, and then it happens, like, <laughs> Every time, like that's, that's how Richard wins the game. Yeah. <laughs> well, oh, Richard's <laughs> drawn thirty cards. Why he's gonna win the game? I'm like, no, I, mean, I just have nothing but birds, <laughs> and I need a couple combat steps. But I remember it was a season with Vince, and uh, we had some random theme. Okay, and Vince brings a winter orb deck, and I too bring a winter orb deck. Okay, and Vince <laughs> slams <laughs> his. <laughs> He slams it down early, right? Like prematurely. And everyone's like, oh my god, Vince. I can't believe you brought like a stacks deck. I can't believe you brought Winter Orb. And I'm there at the Winter Orb in my hand. I could have played it the entire game, but I didn't. And I'm like, for shame, Vince. How could you? <laughs> How could you? Let me attack you to show you. Like, this is terrible. Like... That, you can't play that too early. You can't show your trump cards that early. Like when you yeah. play it, you know you can get targeted, right? So you got to yeah. do it to end the game, right? Like you don't Armageddon on turn four with nothing on board, right? Like you just yeah. die afterwards. You need to make Richard sure you're winning. Practices like like really shows it too, and it's his patience. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I and think it, that's the biggest yeah. thing to take away from this. If you're gonna play something like you, you when you play a weaker tribe or something silly, you have the time. And you also, like mm. Seth mentioned, you really don't show your hand. You hold on to your absolute best card until the moment you either a pick off a player or the table. Yeah. So, so I yeah, think I that's... think that's that's the biggest thing for Richard because I never know what Richard's doing, but I know that we're dying somehow. So, <laughs> yeah. And 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 like the patience that Richard like pr practices leaves us the room to flex our cards and punch each other and exhaust our resources. <laughs> That is true. Like, I feel like Richard has a lot of opportunities where he could commit a lot more to the board and he just chooses not to. Uh, even if he has, like, good cards in hand. But, like, 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 like we, we touched on, Richard has, like, a penchant for playing, like, just a bad, like, a bad deck. Like, it's, it's, a, it's bad tribal cards, like Kithkin or whatever. But That's subjective, it by doesn't the way. matter. <laughs> <laughs> They're fine. They're fine. Sorry. Bad, bad like, skeleton tribal or whatever, whatever. Uh, but, like... It doesn't really matter what the bad cards are because eventually there's going to be a true conviction or an overrun effect or something that allows those bad cards to reach a critical mass and then win the game off them. And, like, you're not going to just blow up, like, a, a board full of... You're not going to gang up against a person who's like, oh, he has a five-mana 2-2, two -two, you know, that has a regenerate for three or something like that. Like, you're not going to you're not gonna take that person out. Why would you? It's like, strategically, it's a bad move. But, like, that, that's what, what works in its advantages. Like, it's hidden power is, like, that hidden information. And also just, like, I think that's, that same thing applies to if you are playing an Arch Enemy deck. Like, okay, let's say you are happening to play Bray or whatever. And you, you're, you like, okay with being the Arch Enemy. I think that's number one. You should be okay with being the Arch Enemy if you're playing an Arch Enemy Commander. But if you don't want to be ganged up on, on the, on the uh, right off the bat... And you are playing Brea, maybe you slow roll your cards a lot, right? Like you don't play your combo pieces until you know for a fact 
you can combo off and win on the same turn. You play really slow, and then when your opponents are like, okay, we got to kill Bray off first, and you're not doing anything, maybe you're just defending yourself, right? You just, you know, aim a removal spell. You're like, okay, if you're attacking me, I'm going to remove your creature, you know? Maybe you should attack somewhere else. That usually works politically wise. And you just chill, and maybe you can play a bunch of crazy cards, but you don't, and you wait for somebody else to become the arch enemy. That's when you have all that time to set up for that, like, just unleash, right? You just go off and combo off. And I think a lot of people, myself included, really jumped the gun on that. Like, like you said with the Orvar deck, I think it was a huge misplay on my part to play that Mystic Sanctuary. I didn't have any combos with it, by the way, but I was, in my brain, I was like, this is not threatening at all. I'm just going to put a bunch of cantrips on top of my library. That's going to be really sweet because I had a bunch of cantrips in my graveyard and I just copied Mystical Sanctuary a bunch of times. But for everybody who's ever seen a Mystical Sanctuary, how many times have you used it fairly? How many times has it not comboed off and won the game? Almost never, right? So I do that. I go shields down. I go shields down completely. And then Seth, Seth, you were running a Tosky deck. It had a bunch yeah. of random tokens on the battlefield. Score you were points. actually scarier than me at that table, and you proved it very quickly because you had an overrun in hand. But, like, we were looking at your, your board. Your board is just, like, one ones. It's like yeah, a bunch, a bunch of one so ones. Whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that those are those weird scenarios because I think in your mind what you were doing probably wasn't scary, but for me it was like super scary, and I felt like I have to kill yeah. Tomer because I saw you cast a bunch of spells. You're like mm. doing trait Mystic doctoring. Sanctuary, like yeah, you, you cast I trait do doctoring. Too. I do it too, hundred percent. I kill, I kill so the Ovar hard. person. <laughs> oh, oh, and on that note of playing patience, uh, being and being, being patient, Richard. It was like Seth on his Brago deck at Vegas, and I'm on my Animar Morph deck, and Richard's on a pre-con, and I, and I remember Richard beat us. <laughs> yeah, it was the pre-con Morph right. deck, the upgraded right. version of <laughs> <laughs> Which is actually why, like, I was thinking back, I, uh, for, I gifted people uh, pre, uh, made decks, pre-made decks, um, in 2019 when I, when I met you all in, in Vegas. Uh, I gave Richard a deck that I actually regret giving him now. I gave him a Najila deck, which I thought, you know, like, Najila is very aggressive. It's a janky tribe. Uh, it fits well with, with Richard. Richard just, like, attacking things. But now I'm thinking about it. Like, Arch like Najila is an arch enemy deck. This is not yeah. actually Richard's style of play. I should have given him, like, a garbage, like, a, a Kithkin deck, right? Like... I'm not but saying kicking or garbage. I'm just I would play out Najila. An example. I, I think if you play arch enemy decks, you need to finish the game, and Najila yeah. allows you to finish the game on you know like very quickly. Same with something like Rograk. I think you're all aware it's an arch enemy commander now, but <laughs> I just drop an Armageddon and good luck, right? Like yeah, I'll three v one. You have no lands. <laughs> like what are you gonna do, right? Like so you yeah. need to actually end the game when you become arch enemy, right? The longer it goes, because it's three people against you right that's like three times the mana three times the card draw three times the combat steps there's no way you'll ever win right you need to like kill someone immediately and maybe 2v1 for a turn uh or just kill everyone like simultaneously or just like stacks or armageddon them out of the game right like there's no way you can keep going uh unless you actually have something like maybe counterbalance top to like police everyone or something like you got to be able to lock them all out otherwise you just can't keep up and then you'll die yeah what do you guys think about fast mana starts? Kind of talking a little bit about avoiding being arch enemy. Like, let's say you have a hand that has a soul ring and a signet and maybe something else, but you don't really have anything super exciting to do with it. Or maybe you just got your commander. Like, do you ever think it's worth it to not run out all the mana and be the person that has twice as many resources because you know you're going to be arch enemy, like with some hands? Like, is that something that enters your mind when you're when you're playing? Depends on my curve, but usually. I actually will delay my fast mana if I play it. Uh, so, like, like being able to, like, soul ring on one is great if I actually have something to soul ring into. As opposed to, like, just soul ring on one flex pass. Right? Because, like, soul ring on one is the essential I'm, I'm, I'm arch enemy. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think that's something that players could probably learn more. Because your instinct is when you first, like, start playing is just, like, I have cards, they're good, I should cast them. Yeah. But... 
I think when it comes to Soul Ring and stuff, like I think that's a card that makes you an arch enemy. Like if you're the only one that plays Soul Ring on turn one, yeah, you're probably gonna become the arch enemy regardless of what else is happening. Didn't like, they have that statistic on Command Zone where they said statistically the person who does a turn one Soul Ring loses more often than the people who don't turn one Soul Ring? And I think that plays into that. Maybe a lot of people are just you know flexing as as the term was, uh, you know, fast mana immediately putting a, a target on their head, but they have no follow-up. Yeah. And I think that's definitely me a lot. <laughs> like, sometimes, like, if, if you have a commander that's, like, you know, Golos or whatever, like, obviously, it doesn't really matter what you're ramping into in your hand. If you're ramping into your commander, your commander's an insane value engine. It doesn't, it, like, do it, obviously. If it's going to yeah. make card advantage, go for it. 100% every single time. But if you're not running a deck like that, if you're running a deck that's very much dependent on the cards that you have in hand, and you just dump out all your mana, <laughs> and you have literally nothing to do with it, then you're just putting, yeah, you're just putting a target on your head. You're just asking the table to remove your your ramp sources as well. Right. Um, and it just could, it could end up killing you. And I think that's also something like, okay, honesty here, I picked Arch Enemy, maybe, because I'm trying to get tips. On how not to be arch enemy. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I, this is a good recording for me. I'm editing this, this afterwards. This is an episode for me, not jot, for everyone Jot this down. So. Jot this down. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah? Yeah, okay, good. Good patience. I, okay. I, I actually disagree with you guys here. I think you dropped the soul ring 100%. Yeah. Like, really? Why put it in your deck? Like, are you telling me you literally can't? At, at worst, you have your commander to cast, right? And uh, anything else you top deck, right? If, if you're not going to cast it, then you should replace it with like a mind stone or something <laughs> like why even put it in your deck at that point right but i think like if you have fast mana you can actually 3v1 right if i'm sitting on six mana you guys are all in two mana i actually have the mana to 3v1 you guys and plus like usually you're left alone after you're beaten down right like <laughs> let's say you play your hand they rat the board <laughs> vandal blast you you're like fine right you got wrecked but then <laughs> They just leave you alone. Like, no one can really, like, kill you on the spot that early, <laughs> right? So I think you always play that, that soul ring, right? Like, you why, always go for it. Why I, would you put yeah, it in your deck I, otherwise? I mean, but, but it's... Because, like, example, like, you... Example, you want to plan your turns, like, multiple turns ahead, right? And I play with my in, the information that I have on board and in hand. Now, if I... If, if example, like... Maybe because it's the deck styles I play, you'll know that I'll never combo you with my mana. Like, literally, we did a stats <laughs> episode. I have zero combo guys. <laughs> Everyone had one, at least. But the thing is, the way, I, like, the way I build my decks is to just essentially build a control deck, right? Like, but instead, change it to like from 60-card format to 100-card format. So I have no insta wins. So I plan my turns ahead, and anything that I'm going to do... It's not really going to, like, be good enough to draw Arch Enemy, like, unless, like, you know, like, I, I have something to follow it up with. Soul Ring, just throwing it out there on turn one is not good unless I'm, if you see me play a Soul Ring on one, it's probably because I have a four drop or something I really want to play. Like a, like a Jace the Mind Sculptor early or something like that. Other than that, I, I don't want to chance it to top decks and all that stuff, so I kind of play a little cautiously, so my play style is just... No, no, it's not, it, you know, like, I, I don't want to do anything that would kill me and draw the aggro now. I'll draw it eventually, <laughs> but, like, like drawing it right off the bat and, like, I don't know. I, I don't want to leave stuff out there to get blown up either. Like, it, it's very easy to blow up a soul ring, a deck fade, and to steal your soul ring. So, like, I want to make sure I get use out of it as opposed to just, hey, check it out. Here it is, soul ring. But, so but it's I, turn I, one. Like, who's going to kill you? And who's really going to Vandal Blast, like, the one soul ring? <laughs> <Right>? uh, <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, would you really? I would. Outside I of Commandeer Strip Mine. <laughs> I would. I, I, I think that it's very sh uh, very crucial to have a follow-up, to, to earn that title of, of, of Arch Enemy. Because it, it, it becomes a very rough game for you. From, like, it doesn't even, like, you said that people may not kill you after they le like after they dunk your board but that does not that's not necessarily true <laughs> because it depends if they one shot you or not <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. if they one shot you then okay sure <laughs> they don't have to they do leave you alone but that's because you're leaving the table alone so <laughs> but but like I, I i think that it is important to definitely stagger your mana uh also like you, you know if, if you can't kill don't play everything don't don't half play a combo like like i'm not gonna play my chain veil and pass Right or something like that. So, I, I and and unlike that, I, I that's why I I personally will not always play Soul Ring, even if I have it on one. So, it, you'll see. Oh, I had it on two. Weird. No, but that's because I I, I 
I think that that's a lot. A lot. It makes all the difference. Just staggering your your fast mana a turn or two. Because I think what you want to avoid is looking like the arch enemy when you're not the arch enemy. Like I think that's the absolute worst position you get in when you like run out all your fast mana and everyone else is like, oh my god, they're gonna do something crazy, and you're looking at your hand like Richard. You're like, oh, I got a bunch of birds or whatever. Like I know <laughs> I'm not. Like so, I think you want to avoid plays that will make everyone perceive you as the arch enemy when you have all the information and you know that your hand can't support being the arch enemy. Like, I think that yeah. is what you want to definitely want to try to avoid. Is if you Sol have a Rick hand that, that can support it, then... We, we see Soul Ring and we're like, must kill? Yeah. I guess it, like, if like, I don't if have you, Ramble, If you Soul Ring and the next person signets, you're only up like one mana, right? Like, it's not like some... It's when you chain it together, right? If you Soul yeah. Ring into like... Signet. Uh, I told did this, a Vizier. Right? And then you're like, why am I being targeted? I'm like, well, you just accelerated and have, like, a lot of card draw, right? So you, like, chained Arch Enemy <laughs> no, card no, into Arch Enemy no, card. No, Arch right? Enemy because sorry. <laughs> you, you can't, like, chain these things. You can't chain, like, fast. Like, you can't, like, chain, like, say, fast mana, fast mana into yeah. wheel. That looks very scary. Right? But if you I go, mean, like, fast scary. mana into, like, normal card, like, I don't know that it's, like... You know that. I, I think anything ahead of like the curve of like what the card is intended to be casted on is always going to be a bad look. So no, p fast mana mm. into like I don't I don't care the the seven mana one one from Scourge. I feel like the thing <laughs> is that you have the ability to right. Yeah. And, and that's the problem. So the fact that you have the ability to instantly puts you on my radar to kill you. And and even let's say even if I don't have anything crazy to play. At, like you had mentioned earlier, at any point you will top deck and play something, right? So I have to either A, deal with literally everything right now, or deal with you. So that, that's that's why I just, like Seth mentioned, if your hand can't support the arch enemy, do not draw it on yourself. Unless yeah, you're I, me, where you <laughs> draw it regardless and so lean into it. <laughs> I guess, you know. I think it's kind of like morphs, like how everyone always kills the morph because of the fear of the unknown. I think it's the same, it, it, it's the same thing, because other totally people... Other people don't know your, they don't know your hand though. So even though you know, like, oh, I'm making all this mana, but I'm not doing anything with it. Everyone else has to assume like, oh, you're one draw away, or maybe you already have in your hand the thing that's going to like win the game or refill your hand or something. So, And commander makes it so that you always have something to play because, well, you're commander. So <laughs> Except for me. Except, yeah, except for <laughs> Seth where you actually just have the mana and you still pass. <laughs> so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or makes a clue token, cracks a clue token, and passes. <laughs> or makes uh, ice yeah. treasures. I guess, I, I guess it makes... Context is important, right? Like, if you are playing a scary deck full of scary cards, maybe staggering it is correct if you don't have, like, a way to just, you know, confidently take out everybody. But I think Richard makes a good point as well in terms of, like, I think I think he can probably convince people not to attack him if he's playing, like, Moonfolk Tribal. Although, no, no, Moonfolk are good. Moonfolk are good. How dare I? Uh, yes. Kithkin Tribal. Of course. For example, randomly. Um, so, yeah, like, if I see, if I see, if I personally see Richard go turn one, Sol Ring, turn two, a four drop Merfolk, that I wouldn't play even in limited. Uh, I'll probably, <laughs> I'll probably not be as concerned with him. And there's been a lot of games where I'm like, where I'm like, he's playing, he's playing nonsense, and he draws like, he draws like six cards. Generally speaking, when I see somebody draw six cards, I'm like terrified, right? Because if you draw six cards in a good deck full of good cards, you drew six good cards. Someone like Richard, when he's drawing six cards, it feels like to me like he's only drawn two cards. I feel very because he's drawn here. like <laughs> I feel very picked on here. <laughs> I'm just hypothetically, this is, this hypothetically, is not a safe anybody space. playing what's wrong person, with Kithkin? <laughs> if a person playing a bad deck draws six cards, it feels like it feels similar to a deck that's good drawing two cards in my brain. It's still scary, obviously. Like, eventually enough bad cards are going to overwhelm the table. Or you're going to go with, like, the True Conviction or whatever. And it doesn't matter what you have. As long as you have bodies on the table, you're going to win. Um, but, like, that's usually when I'm, what my, at least, threat assessment is. Like, if Seth is running a good deck and draws, like, ten cards, I'm like... We need to kill Seth, or else we lose. Or like Krim is running a good deck, or not even I, a I, good deck, now. a troll I, deck. He's like, he drew ten troll cards. I don't want to deal with that. I need to kill him now. Like, 
You've got I, ten ways to be annoying. <laughs> I feel like I should get the benefit of the doubt because you know I'm just drawing more card draw spells. It's true. Like, <laughs> and they're just going to draw me more card draw spells. So there's really no threat there. <laughs> to be fair, well, you have been getting more aggressive. I've been trying. A little bit. And you've been successful, I think. Tosky yeah. was a good... I think Wait. drawing cards in general is another way to get aggro because you also yeah. draw aggro because the figures <laughs> you can't. My thought process is I see you draw. I don't, I don't care how many cards it is. One card, 20 cards. The figures that I, I don't know. And it's a lot like what Seth had mentioned earlier. The fear of the unknown is what has me killing you. So hmm. the fact that you just drew more unknowns is a problem. So having and then having all the fast mana, early mana to play these unknowns makes it even worse. So. The, the worst thing you could do is go fast mana, draw a ton of cards. I Oh, yeah. You, you, like, whatever I have. Fast I'm mana wheel. Like, yeah. that is that is a top tier. That's CDH, right? Like, yeah. CDH, yeah. the ideal turn one play outside of winning the game is just, like, dump your handful of mana and then resolve a time twister or something like that, right? Yeah. Like, there's nothing. There's The only thing better than that is turn one winning the game. That's the second best play that any of that can do is, like, Which wheel. might feel like you actually lost. No, because... You do probably draw more cards if you're winning the game. I prefer winning. I prefer drawing more cards than winning. Yeah, oh yeah, of course. <laughs> I don't know. I consider that that's my metric on winning the game. Yeah, you like, guys are so like 2014 magic. Nowadays we draw so many cards. Like <laughs> drawing cards is no longer special. But I can. But the goal is to draw that's more true. than the last person. Yeah. Right. Like that's so. <laughs> That's I, I wonder if we can get that out. metric if, like, our average number of cards drawn has gone up over the seasons of Commander Clash just due to power creep of, mm. like, <laughs> Wizards printing all his card draw. Well, I, I guess... guess yeah. We don't run out of gas that often. Like, games usually go pretty long before you run out of gas. And there are games that go on for hours, and we're all still full of gas because someone wheeled again at some point, everyone's drawing, like, 60 cards, and... Seth just only casts like ancient cravings, and, and then somehow he's at like yeah. nine life. Wheel yeah. of misfortune, yeah, wheel of twenty nine life. <laughs> I mean, power creep and card accessibility. It's not even like getting wheel of misfortune, for example, is not power creep per se compared to like wheel of fortune because it's a worse card, I would say. But like just having higher and higher accessibility to high tier. Well, it, uh, it's power draw. creep to everything else that's not wheel. Like yeah, any other true. red card that draw is, is power creep crept by wheel yeah. misfortune, right? Like yeah. every counter spell has been power crept like five times with all our free counter spells, right? Like why? I don't know what we used to play back then. Before like uh, force of negation, force of will, <laughs> fierce guardianship. Like what? What was the second counter spell that we played? Like I, I don't know what that it was. wasn't for. Like that wasn't force of will. <laughs> Yeah, like what, what, what are the literal these, literal counter spell? Negation? Manage rain, Man. counter spell. Yeah. I liked spell pierce for a long time. So after counter spell, we're down to spell pierce, right? But like we I don't like play any of those cards Swan anymore. Song. Yeah. Cryptic command. Uh, I also I, think the I found the redundancy. A lot of I think the redundancy matters a lot to you in Commander because you're 100 yeah. card singleton. So getting Wheel of Misfortune to go with your Wheel of Fortune is huge because now you kind of have two wheels in your deck or whatever. So uh, it gets away. It gets you're around on a motorcycle. Like, uh, it, <laughs> Yeah, the bicycle. We're doing it. Yeah. Um, but it gets around the, the restriction of the format. Actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I almost don't know if I like that. Like, having so much redundancy. Doesn't that make Commander... I mean, this would be a whole other topic, but doesn't it make it a little bit more like other formats where you get to play play sets of cards? If yes. you have, like, Wheel of yes. Fortune, a Wheel of Misfortune, and another Wheel of Fortune, and another Wheel of like, Or, like, yeah, 11 tutors. Stuff. You know yeah. what I mean? So, yeah. Like that. It, kind, so of goes, it mm. kind of goes against spirit a bit. Yeah. I think decks but that is another now. topic. <laughs> that will be another time. topic. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> but okay, so we've covered pretty extensively Arch Enemy. And just as a recap, um, so kill Crim tips. first. That's, kill, that's nope, all you need to know. Kill Crim first. Uh, we don't even need to do a Kill Tober first, first yeah. unless Crim decides <laughs> to gift us with a turn two Already, counterbalance. I just took notes. All right. Just ha like, anything. Tober's always I'm half flexing. Anything. He's always half flexing. I could kill, kill you. Tober Already. Tober plays mean cards. I think that's the gist of it. It's no, like kill Vince first. You know Vince Armageddon. always gonna stack you eventually, right? <laughs> like Tober do? will always play some weird We're getting two card We're combo. not even in a game right now, Richard. <laughs> How can you do this? You are you are like, getting the most times. You micro synth lattice us the most times. 
<laughs> I am the mean player. That's true. Ah. Remember, I'm Maybe the one that monologues. Maybe you should adjust your approach to politic. <laughs> right. I'm the villain that monologues, so you never have to worry. Well, you do, but you, you, you know when it's going to happen. It's going to be in like 90 turns. Uh, I, right. I think the other key part is, uh, we did talk about it, but you need to be able to fight back, right? Yeah. Like, if you... Like, if you are known for someone who will become arch enemy, people will automatically attack you, right? But if you fight back, they'll be less likely to do it. And I mean, like, a real fight back. Not like, I'll just remove your one spell and run out of stuff, right? But if you actually have a board where you're like, yeah, if you want to pick on me, I'll destroy you, right? <laughs> and usually I, I can do that, right? You. Usually I'm the only one playing creatures on board, right? So I'm, like, kind of self-protected, even though my creatures suck. Like, people don't have That's creatures, true. right? I, I will, like, strike back, right? And you need well, to... creatures don't draw cards. Yeah. Unless you have ways to draw cards off them, right? So... You need to play, like, Crim, where all your cards are, like, X for ones. No, you know, targeted removal. But you need to have enough such that when someone comes at you, you can swords them and, like, show them who's boss. But, like, you don't usually want to do that, right? You just want to, like, play, like, Decree of Pain, draw, like, five cards and wrath the board. Mm -hmm. But you need to be able to fight back when you're Arch Enemy to... Show people that there's a cost, right? Like, maybe he is the arch enemy, but I don't want to lose my board taking care of him. So I'll let Krim take care of him, <laughs> right? Nope. And then and then you just made a friend, Patience. right? So, Tell me. Yeah. Patience. Patience. You got the notes? <laughs> I have them all jotted down. Don't worry. I also have to edit it. Apparently, I'm just <laughs> default arch enemy, even, even in a podcast about yes, arch enemy. Just, just, kiki I'm, Jiki I'm combo, man. How many Kiki Jiki combos have we eaten? <laughs> It's like the week. What is it? It's Warrior Week this week, and then for some reason we die. <laughs> Kiki Jiki combo. Armageddon the most time. <laughs> Microsoft <laughs> Lattice like three games this season. Yet I am the arch enemy. I make oh no boy. excuses for that. I, I, when you destroy me after an Armageddon, I a hundred percent accept that. <laughs> in defense of definitely. Tomer and his Warrior deck, it it is a Warrior deck in the same way that my Skithrix decks was a Dragon deck. <laughs> Because it is not a lie. There's exactly a dragon, one warrior, yeah. and it is the commander. Yeah, I, play, I played a warrior in both games. I don't know who yeah. you're talking about. No, I, 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 it checks. You played your commander. <laughs> okay. So I think we, we covered the arch enemy topic pretty well now. But just as a quick recap, just like a TLDR of this entire podcast, if you didn't want to listen to us for an hour and you wanted like the spark notes on it. There are certain commanders that are always going to be arch enemy. So if you don't want to be arch enemy, perhaps don't run them. Like it doesn't matter if you're making a fair Golos deck, a fair Azami deck, or whatever you consider it. You're going to be targeted anyway. So we've established that part, and I think that's an important thing. If you are going to be playing an arch enemy deck and you don't want to be arch enemy, you have to either be able, as Richard said, be able to fight back, be able to put yourself in a position where people people targeting you are going to deter them from doing it. Either, as Krim does, with lots of board wipes, three for ones, a lot of interaction to deter people from just, you know, developing their board and swinging at you. Or the Richard way, where you actually have this intimidating board state, and if somebody swings at you, you can always swing right back at them. So there's, there's ways... To play the arch enemy and not actually get killed immediately. But also mentality wise, if you are playing an arch enemy commander, don't don't get salty. <laughs> like yeah. if you're playing an arch enemy commander, they're going like if they don't focus on you, you can randomly win the game. It doesn't matter if you personally do not have the cards in hand and you feel like because you have knowledge of what cards are in your hand and on your board state, you know that you're not going to win the game now or the turn after. Your opponents don't have that information and they do know that you can win the game immediately the turn you do have your stuff. It's going to happen. So don't get salty about it. Do it the crim way where you're embracing things. And uh, yeah, general oh. tips of not being arch enemy. Yeah, go ahead. And one last thing. Counter spells are good for the game. Don't be. <laughs> don't <laughs> don't act surprised. What about don't, don't, balance? I will say it again. Everybody acts like somebody like tripped them or like you know said something about their mother. Did they get counterspelled? But don't. But like don't care if you combo off. It's like counter spells aren't that bad. Everyone chill. <laughs> Let me resolve my spell, Krim. <laughs> I, I think counter spells are an immediate yeah. way to get targeted. <laughs> People are very salty when their cards don't resolve, even though, 
Like, if you resolve it against Doombladed, they're, like, fine with it's that. But if you counterspell it on the stack, the it's, like, not cool. went on the board, right? Like, yeah. at least yeah. it went there, it it. and I got to enjoy it briefly. <laughs> <laughs> it's how many steps of the removal process is. Like, the, the creature's life cycle, right? It gets cast, it goes onto the board, and then it dies, right? <laughs> And then the counterspell player is going from, like, step one is stopping it at step one. And the removal player is stopping it at, like, step three or beyond. And I think Same that's result. what gets people. Same result. Same result. Mentality, it's different, I think. But, like, I agree that counterspell is fine. Like, you, you should be running a couple of them. Just don't be counterspell. It's a one for maybe one. It's a bad card. Don't, yeah. don't counterbalance. Them. Maybe don't counterbalance. Maybe that's maybe that's a, a step too I don't far. I don't even think that's a good card. To the <laughs> dude with the counterbalance background. Oh yeah, yeah, fair enough. Gavin but would definitely it, agree with you. It still gets you. It still gets you killed first though every time. Yeah. It does, and it's you worth know. it every time. Yeah. <laughs> every time. <laughs> And and then I guess in general, like even if you're not playing an arch enemy deck, if you're not playing a, a deck that is particularly scarily scary. Uh, maybe consider slow rolling your hand. Maybe don't show everything. Don't go ham unless you know you can back it up. Like Richard said, like if you can back it up, you go for it, right? Like maybe you can just 1v3 the entire table and, and you'll survive. But if you know for a fact that your deck is absolute trash and you just paint a big target on yourself, uh, it's probably maybe bad to uh, overextend a little bit. So those are the, those are the things we wanted to cover on the arch enemy topic episode one of the podcast, and that's gonna wrap it up, everybody. We went for about an hour, a nice a nice chunk of time. Um, let us know what you think about this podcast. Uh, let us know if there's any topics that you want covered, and in future episodes, episode two and beyond, this is the this is the time right now that we'd be covering uh, your fish mail, your. Uh, clash mail as it were uh, so please use the hashtag clash mail uh, to tweet at us and get us those topics or you can leave a comment with your co uh, with your question down below in the comment section and uh, we'll we'll answer it here right now this is with the time we'd be doing it but we're not doing it right now because we don't have any questions yet just to be just to be sure about that anyway that's that's our show hope everybody enjoyed and uh, take care, and we might be back soonish. We don't have the schedule yet. Okay, bye. <laughs> and wrap. <laughs> Sweet. Sweet. Yeah, that went. That went well. Yeah.